leave the house. Let's go and find out. Well, to answer this question, we've got to work our way through the novel because the answer to this question is right at the end of this novel. So, we are moving from New York, last week's video, The Great Gatsby, to the southern state of Alabama. So this book is uh, widely read, it's part of the US curriculum in high school, uh, perhaps comparable to um, Thomas Mann's Budenbrock's or uh, Leo Tolstoy's The War and Peace in terms of its relevance and that like, being compulsory. Um, it's, um, but it's controversial and debatable and I've come across many um, discussions, especially here on YouTube, uh, about is it the right book to read when uh, it comes to teaching race relations and um, the you know African American um, history and so on and so forth, because this book is of course about race and race relations, about the way the white people used to treat the black people. It's about racial segregation because um, the black people in this novel do not live in the fictional town of Maycomb, but live on the outskirts of Maycomb, uh, behind the Maycomb County dump, so you see the separate but equal doctrine does not seem to be uh, the case here, right? Uh, it's also about, um, for example, uh, Bob Ewells, right? He receives um, the welfare benefits, so, and it's hinted that he sort of is classified as the, the undeserving poor because they've been receiving those benefits for three generations now. So people's background is discussed quite frequently here, in my view. So, for example, um, Atticus, right, the main character, um, who's um, a lawyer, and he is appointed by the court to defend a black man, Tom Robinson. Obviously, his head on or he still has an unfair advantage of being born into, first of all, a white family and secondly, into the family that's uh, afforded his education um, to become a lawyer. Before we dive into the nitty-gritty of today's video, I would like to let you in on... Let you on in? Let you in on. Nice phrasal preposition verb, isn't it? <laughs> so I'd like to let you in on my reading process because to me reading a book in English in this case isn't just about the plot so what the story is about it's got so much more to it. I, I've tried to activate all of my channels, perception channels so to speak, to expand the uh, mental lexicon extent uh, to um, build upon my pre-knowledge and I've obviously consulted this absolutely gorgeous book it's called American Civilization by uh, David Mock and John Auckland I will link the books that I've been using for uh, this video uh, in the description box underneath why would you consult this book American Civilization on introduction well um, to look up some historical things, the um, the Civil War, the Reconstruction Era, the abolition of slavery, uh, such persons as Rosa Parks and Martin Luther King and John F. Kennedy and obviously of course Abraham Lincoln, um, the Civil Rights Movement, right? And first and foremost of course to look up the judiciary branch in the States because we spend so much time in the courtroom here because Tom Robinson is being tried with court uh, um, instances of cross-examination. Secondly, I uh, love working on my pronunciation uh, in English because um, English is not a phonemic language, meaning there are so many deviations. Um, once I've um, finished reading a chapter and if I've accumulated 
quite a few instances of words I'm not sure about how to pronounce them correctly, I would pause my reading process and take a listen uh, on Audible. I'll show you what it looks like. One. When he was nearly 13, my brother Jim got his arm badly broken at the elbow. When it healed, and Jim's fears of never being able to play football were assuaged. Assuaged? Thirdly, obviously, to clarify the meaning of the words that I encounter, I use the Cambridge Online Dictionary. I absolutely love it. Assuaged. Assuaged. Assuage. To make unpleasant feelings less strong. So. Alleviate. And then, of course, I also love to uh, watch a film adaptation if there is one. Tom Robinson is being tried in court. Thank you. Hi, if you've made it so far to the second part of this video, then this is an indication that you are as much interested in English grammar as I am. And for um, the reason that I'm not a grammarian, right, I've been using this wonderful book, Oxford English Course. It comes in three parts or three levels, basic, intermediate and advanced. And I've been using the advanced. Oh, I would like to begin with this sentence. Miss Caroline seemed unaware that the ragged denim shirt it and flower sex coated first grade comma most of whom had chopped cotton and fed hops from the time they were able to walk comma were immune to imaginative literature so here um, scout thinks that miss caroline's severely uh, overestimated uh, classes abilities right um, based on their appearances, their background. Obviously, she's talking about Walter Cunningham, one of the um, boys who's really poor, and um, he represents this stratum of the American society back then. Uh, the Cunninghams are country folks, farmers, and the crush hit them hardest. And so, um, Walter Cunningham's father, he's been using Articus services, so, He's done some legal work for him and he has to pay him back but he doesn't have any money so what he does is he um, brings him some hickory nuts or collards I think they're called right cabbage uh, and so on and so forth the future perfect before the years out I'll have been paid I will have been paid. This is the future perfect meaning that this um, activity will have been completed by a certain time in the future, meaning by the end of the year, right? So it's also about literacy, isn't it? And the ability to read and write. And Scout comes to school, so she starts school aged six. Uh, and she's literate, so she can read and write. Um, and Miss Caroline discovers it, and it says here, so she discovered that I was literate and looked at me with more than faint distaste, and she asks her to tell Atticus to stop teaching her. I will take over from here and try to undo the damage. I beg your pardon? The damage? Students come to school with individual free knowledge, right? Your job is just to activate it, isn't it? Let's move on to the conditional clauses. The conditional clauses. How many conditionals do we have? Three, right? First conditional, second conditional, third conditional. Scout is devastated because the teacher has forbidden her to read 
and write at home and it's been a habit, a good habit um, every night with Atticus, right? And he says, attention please, the first conditional. If you concede the necessity of going to school, comma, we'll go on reading every night just as we always have. Is it a bargain? Right? So let's break it down a bit. If you will concede the necessity of going to school, comma, we will go on reading every night just as we always have, right? So it's a condition, that's why it's called conditional, right? Um, because if you don't concede the necessity of going to school, then we won't go on reading every night just as we always have. Article says, I have to make a living. Besides, they'd put me in jail if I kept you at home, right? So they would put me in jail if I kept you at home. This is the second conditional, right? You've got the past tense in the if clause and the would plus the infinitive in the main clause, right? If I kept you at home, they would put me in jail. Let's elaborate on this uh, a bit more. Um, Attica says sometimes it's better to bend the law a little in special cases. In your case, the law remains rigid. You must obey the law, right? And he's uh, obviously functioning as a figure, a very like morally upright, very obedient, uh, which makes me question his decision uh, to hush up something that happens right at the end of this novel. Interesting. Then he's not uncompromising, right? So he teaches her what a compromise is. Um, so a compromise is an agreement reached by mutual concessions. Right? And then he goes on with this example of the first conditional that I've just given you, if you will concede, right? So concessions, make concessions in order to reach compromise, right? Um, it's the opposite of being uncompromising, right? For example, a sister, the aunt, Alexandra. And the one instance of the third conditional. Um, Scout notices that uh, it's a bit too much for Miss Caroline. Like, um, she can't manage the class, right? She, she, she has these management issues. And obviously, uh, I think she catches her crying at one point. And she says, had her conduct been more friendly towards me, I would have felt sorry for her. Right? So we've got the past perfect in the if clause or like this dependent clause, right? Like if your conduct had been more friendly towards me, right? You can just omit the if um, conjunction. Had your conduct been more friendly towards me, comma, I would have felt sorry for her, right? I would have felt sorry for her, right? Um, talking about the unreal past. Right? So it's in the past. She can't. She, she can't change it. She looks back on it. She is reflecting about her reaction to her crying, and she says, hmm, "I would have reacted differently if she had been, uh, or if she had shown a different attitude towards me." Right. <laughs> The non-defining relative clauses. Why are they so important? Because they are a very uh, practical tool to uh, squeeze a lot of additional information into a sentence without making two or three sentences. It's perfect, isn't it? So, the sentence goes, Cecil Jacobs, comma, who lived at the far end of our street next door to the post office, comma, walked a total of one mile per school day to avoid the Radley Place and old Mrs. Henry DuBose, I think. It's different with Scout and Jam. They are really curious. They want him to come out. They want to get to know him. They feel sorry for him that he's been shut up for so many years. When we'll be talking about the indirect speech, 
uh, I'll show you a couple of instances from that scene when they try very hard to uh, make him come out. So the second example um, is about their attempt to make Boo Radley come out and they've written him a note like they want to make uh, friends and so Scott says occasionally I looked back at Jem, comma, he was patiently trying to place the note on the windowsill it would flutter to the ground and Jem would jab it up we're given some additional information about what Jem was doing right? trying to place the note with a fishing uh, with a fishing pole on the windowsill which was very tiresome and cumbersome and it wouldn't work and but she was very patient right the two long packages were from Atticus comma who had written Uncle Jack to get them for us comma and they were what we had asked for right again additional information what Atticus had done to get them for uh, Scout and Jam squeezed into the sentence. Um, I've also come across the interesting uh, verb with an interesting prefix. It's um, to outrun. I could only hope that Jam would outrun the tire and me, or that I would be stopped by a bump in the sidewalk. Right? So um, they are rolling in the tyre and um, Scout is in the tyre and Gemma has pushed her with all his might and she's um, actually made it to the front gate of the Redley place if I'm not mistaken and so yeah so he would outrun meaning run quicker than she is, is rolling in the tyre right outrun <laughs> quite many adjectives in this book which say uh, prefix in and also with prefix um. So examples are incomprehensible how so reasonable a creature could live in peril of everlasting torment was incomprehensible. Right? As opposed to comprehensible. Articus says but to do something like this to a sick old lady is inexcusable. Uh, and when Articus asks Jem are you responsible for this? He says something inaudible, which is not hard to memorize because I love listening to audiobooks on Audible. When a scout is talking about her aunt Alexandra, she says she was an incurable gossip. With the un prefix, we've got unthinkable, unfathomable. I think scout is talking about the reasons that were unfathomable why it started snowing and Maycomb deal was around. Um, there was a certain routine to her life, but without him, life was unbearable. When Jem let Scout in on uh, their plan to make Boo come out, um, he, so Jem said placidly, we are going to give a note to Boo Radley. Scout says, just how? I was trying to fight down the automatic terror rising in me. And then the example of indirect speech. Jem was merely going to put the note on the end of a fishing pole and stick it through the shutters. If anyone came along, Till would ring the bell. What we have here is the back shift in tense, right? So in direct speech, Jam um, would have said, I am merely going to put the note, right? And then when we report the direct speech, we um, use the past tense, right? Because he said, I am merely going, we go past tense, right? Uh, Jem was merely going. If anyone comes along, says Jem, and Scout, uh, as a reporter of his direct speech, says, if anyone came along, right? Well, second, second condition, wasn't it? If anyone came along, Dill would ring the bell. Scout says, in the American way, what are you gonna do, right? 
what are you gonna do? Dill and Jam were simply going to peep in the window with the loose shutter to see if they could get a look at Bo Radley. I could go straight home and keep my fat flopping mouth shut. Right, so the moment she was talking to Jem, he said, Deal and I are simply going to peep. And because she's reporting his speech, she uses were simply going to peep. Right? You can go straight home, Scout, if you're scared, right? I could go straight home. Can becomes could. Am becomes was. Are becomes where. Because nobody could see them at night, because articles would be so deep in a book, he wouldn't hear blah blah blah, right? The reasons Jem uh, is giving a scout why on this day it was the last day of the summer and uh, before school starts again. <laughs> Right? So, because no one can see us, could not see them. Instead of saying, Dill is going to watch the front of the house, Jem says, Dill's gonna watch the front of the house. What are you gonna do? Instead of saying, what are you going to do? So, ain't. He ain't got to be it. Instead of saying, he doesn't have or he hasn't got, he ain't got to be a scout says to her uncle, you ain't fair because he gives her a lesson or he teaches her a lesson by whipping her because she's been using foul language towards Francis and he hadn't heard scout's sight, only the sight of Francis and she says you ain't fair. Right? instance of the subjunctive in English is Jem pulled at his grandfather's watch that Atticus let him carry once a week if Jem were careful with it. On the days he carried the watch Jem walked on eggs. Right? So if Jem was seems like right doesn't it? Uh, third person singular, right? He, she, it, the, s Goes with it, right? But not in the subjunctive. Also, I've come across some words that are spelled differently in American English. Pyjama in British English is spelled with an Y. P Y J A M A, right? But in American English, it's spelled with an A. P A J A M A. I put on my pyjamas. of uncountable nouns. I scooped up some snow, right? You can't count, count snow. You can just estimate roughly an amount of snow, right? So some snow or I don't know, one scoop of snow, right? <laughs> one snowflake, but not one snow. Let's talk about the present participle just for a minute. Um, I've come across a very interesting construction. So the sentence goes, Atticus says to uh, Jem, you can't go around making caricatures of the neighbors, right? Uh, go around doing something, right? They've got some snow and in the backyard they've made a snowman uh, who very much resembles uh, Mr. Avery or Avery Avery, I think. And then they put, um, Miss Maudie's hat on him and then he becomes Mrs. Maudie, right? And Attica says, you can't go around making characters of the neighbors. Like, you can't, you can't let it become a habit. And Miss Maudie unexpectedly says, I hated that old cow barn, thought of setting fire to it a hundred times myself, except they'd lock me up. Um, thought of setting fire, but we know that the preposition of, right, it requires the present participle. So, Uncle Jack disapproves of the way how a scout is uh, speaking. So he says, I'll be here a week 
and I don't want to hear any words like that while I'm here. Scout, you'll get in trouble if you go around saying things like that. Basically, we've got the first condition here, right? And this nice construction, go around doing something with the present participle, right? You'll get in trouble if you go around saying things like that, right? If you continue doing stuff like that, right? I warn you, don't you dare. After his misdemeanor <laughs> that Jem did to the flowers in Mrs. DeBose, um garden, right? Uh, by the way, we've got the flower beds here and not the potato beds as we had in Disgrace. Potato beds, do you remember guys? Uh, Lucy and her potato beds in Disgrace. Here we've got flower beds and Miss Modi uh, spent so much time in her flower beds here. Uh, so, Artika says, go and apologize and uh, she wants him to read to her. Uh, Scout is scared. And she says, you just sent him on to get shot at, when all he was doing was standing up for you. He says, when you and Jem are grown, maybe you look back on, so maybe you look back on, look back on, like this, right? So look back on, reflect, um, like retrospectively, right? So you look back on another very nice phrasal verb, phrasal prepositional verb. Uh, so because look, the lexical verb is followed by back adverb, which is followed by a particle preposition on. When you and Gemma grown, maybe you'll look back on this with some compassion and some feeling that I didn't let you down. Uncle Jack says, you're growing out of your pants a little, which brings me to this little video about some differences between some English and American words, because to me, pants are something different in British English. Take a look. According to this book, this is a sidewalk, but in British English, it's a pavement. According to this book, these are pants. But in British English, these are trousers. According to this book, Women wear up here are called bangs, but in British English it's a fringe. So, does Boo Radley ever leave the house? Ta da! He does. Once. In daylight. No, it's not in daylight. It was actually peach dark, peach black outside. And he comes out to save the lives of. Scout and Jem, because Mr. Bob Evil, you, you, um, attempts to kill them in the schoolyard, and he comes to their defense. And we understand, as um, as a reader, that he kills him, even though Mr. Sheriff tries to hush it up and says, "No, no, he tripped over uh, the tree root or one of the roots, and he fell on his knife." Well, that'll do, that'll do for today's video, guys. I mean, obviously, I could have I could have packed so much more into this video, but that'll do, so that's enough. Uh, I don't want to bore you, I don't want to overwhelm you. I'm sure that this video has become long enough for you to digest, if you're interested in the grammar, uh, in the English grammar as I am. Um, anyway, I wish you all success, I wish you joy, I wish you uh, the best of luck. And I'll see you in my next video. See you in the car. Tschüss zusammen. Bye, guys.